It's a day Teresa and Darren King will never forget. Shortly after moving to their new home in Wapato, near Yakima, their then six-year-old son Travis wandered away from the house. Teresa described the moment she realized Travis was gone, quote, like her feet were in concrete, end quote. He was eventually found, thankfully unharmed, in an irrigation ditch near their property. Travis King, a 12-year-old boy with autism, and the Bills namesake joined his family and the Bills sponsor, Representative Gina McCabe, in Olympia for the signing. House Bill 1258, otherwise known as the Travis Alert Act, was originally crafted with Travis and other individuals with autism in mind, until the bill was expanded to address all persons with special needs. Now that the bill has become law, Travis will, says more lives will be saved. The bill calls for an assessment of the resources necessary to improve the enhanced 911 program, so information pertaining to an individual's disability or special need can be available to first responders before they arrive to the scene of an emergency. It would also require the Department of Health, in concert with other agencies, to review existing procedures and create a training program for first responders, providing instruction for how to best respond to emergencies involving individuals with special needs. Teresa King says she can rest easy knowing fire departments and emergency medical service personnel will be provided critical information tailored to an individual's specific disability or need when responding to emergencies. McKay began work on the bill after the 2015 legislative session when the King family reached out to her with an idea to alert first responders of the presence of an individual with special needs at the scene of an emergency. The Kings had already adopted their own alert system by painting a blue colored puzzle piece on their mailbox, a symbol often used for autism awareness. Overall goals of Travis Alert Act are to maximize the safety of persons with disabilities, minimize the likelihood of injury to persons with disabilities, promote the safety of all persons present, provide tools for fire departments and emergency medical services personnel to easily and quickly determine the specific scenario into which they are entering. Fire departments and emergency medical services agency must ensure their employees are adequately trained and familiarized with techniques, procedures, and protocols for best handling situations in which people with particular disabilities are present at the scene of an emergency. The training program cognitive goals are to identify ways to maximize the safety on the scene for patients, providers, and the public, to identify ways to minimize the likelihood of injury to a person with disabilities on the scene of an emergency, to identify the following for each main disability topic definitions, essential tips, and etiquette, best practices for communication techniques, best practices for providing assistance and removing barriers, to apply the checklist disabilities, to identify resources for information related to different disabilities. The training program, and then the cognitive goals are, like, like that, like. The effective goals are to be aware of the importance of understanding and using people first language. To be aware of the effects related to health, safety, and independence. To understand the importance of allowing people to maintain health, safety, and independence. To exemplify a commitment to excellence as an EMS professional in regard to the care of people with disabilities and others with access and functional needs. Psychomotor goals are expresses techniques that minimize the likelihood of injury to person with disabilities on the scene of an emergency, express the ability to use the checklist tool, expresses the ability to use de-escalation techniques. Good morning, Bob. Good morning there, big man. Morning, Alice! There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's 
It's okay. You'll get the hang of it. One easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help, but do us both a favor and please ask me first. What you think might be helping? I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take my arm? Sure. Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't touch me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind. May I help you? Does not mean I'm deaf. I don't know. I think he said he was going to come. But... Just because I'm deaf. Doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair. Doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath. Relax. We don't bite. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi. Would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no thanks, but can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Alice. Good morning. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. There's no need to be awkward. The Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. This includes people who have a record of such an impairment, even if they do not currently have a disability. It also includes people who do not have a disability but are regarded as having a disability. An impairment is any loss or abnormality of psychological, physiological, or anatomical structure or function. Disability, any restriction or lack resulting from an impairment of ability to perform a major life activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. Major life activities include, but are not limited to, caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, breathing, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating, and working. Major life activities also include the operation of major bodily functions, such as the immune system and normal cell growth, which covers people with HIV or cancer. People with disabilities are people first. People with disabilities are no more easily defined by their disability than they are by their gender, age, race, or national origin. The way we refer to people with disabilities in our communication is important. Lack of awareness about disabilities can lead to unintended stereotypes and discrimination. The way we view and communicate with and about people with disabilities shape our relationships. People's first language puts the emphasis on the person before the disability. Examples given in the table refer to a person's disability only if it is relevant. Avoid terms that lead to exclusion, for example, Special is associated with separate and segregated plans and services.
Use common sense. Do not separate people from assistive devices or essential equipment if possible. Disabilities are not always apparent. Do not get tunnel vision or classify based on assumptions. Do not assume. Clarify by asking questions. Avoid making assumptions or generalizations about the level of functioning or understanding of a person based on a disability. Do not label people. Many people with disabilities have excellent health. Likewise, use of normal person implies that the person with a disability is abnormal. No one wants to be labeled as abnormal. Always ask if you can offer assistance before you provide assistance. Respect personal space. Be sensitive about physical contact. Always speak directly to the person, not to his or her escort. Be patient and respectful. Apply basic courtesies to all people. Try not to avoid interrupting a person. Do not finish the person's sentence. Do not give multiple commands. Ask or state one thing at a time and allow time for a person to respond. Communication. The most important tool in communicating with anybody is respect. Treat the other person as you would like to be treated. Identify yourself and others with you when you approach the person. Tell him or her your name and role if it's appropriate. Talk face to face. Maintain eye contact if possible and appropriate. Always speak directly to the person. Unless a communication barrier is obvious, it is best not to assume one exists unless the person, a family member, or other caregiver tells you about the barrier. Even when a communication difficulty exists, the exact barrier and the best way to address it often varies. Communicate clearly and plainly. Avoid jargon. Speak at your regular speed and volume. Do not pretend to understand when you do not. Repeat what you do understand and ask for the part you didn't understand to be repeated. Let people share or indicate how they communicate best. Community Outreach Suggestions Building partnerships with local community resource provides benefits for EMS providers and community members. EMS providers should establish relationships with people within their jurisdiction who have disabilities so that they can better respond to occurring emergencies. No one knows the needs or abilities of a person with disabilities more than the person themselves. It is recommended that EMS professionals involve people with disabilities in emergency planning and training. Nothing about us without us is the philosophy that all people have the right to provide input to how they receive care. Physical disability is defined as a condition that substantially limits one or more basic physical activities in life. Example, walking, climbing stairs, reaching, carrying, or lifting. These limitations hinder the person from performing activities of daily living. Activities of daily living, or ADLs, are the basic tasks of everyday life such as eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, and transferring. Some mobility impairments are caused by conditions present at birth, while others are the result of an illness or physical injury. Injuries cause different types of mobility impairments depending on what area of the body is affected. People with physical impairments often use mobility aids such as crutches, canes, wheelchairs, and walkers to obtain mobility. Essential tips and etiquette for people with mobility and physical impairments. Ask how the patient has been transported before. Not all lift, carry, load, and position techniques will be safe. Avoid using the classic fireman's carry. Ask people before moving them from their wheelchair. Do not separate people from their assistive devices. However, most ambulances are not equipped to transport people in wheelchairs. Find local transportation sources. Example, lift equipped vans or buses to assist. Learn where special ramps, winch systems, bariatric tarps, and stretchers are available. People with mobility impairments are not deaf, visually impaired, or cognitively impaired. The only accommodation you may need to make are those related to the mobility impairment. People who use a wheelchair, walker, or cane often consider this technology to be an extension of their body. They are part of the person's personal space and should be treated with dignity and respect. Do not lean on assistive devices, push them, or move them without explicit permission. When given permission to push a wheelchair, push slowly at first. Wheelchairs can pick up momentum fast. When carrying the person, avoid putting pressure on his or her arms, legs, or chest. This may result in spasms, pain, and may even interfere with their ability to breathe. 
Canes, crutches, or other mobility devices. A person using a mobility device may be able to negotiate stairs independently. One hand is used to grasp the handrail, while the other hand is used for the cr crutch or cane. Do not interfere with a person's movement unless asked to do so, or the nature of the emergency is such that absolute speed is the primary concern. If this is the case, tell the person what you will need to do and why. Ask if you can help by offering to carry the extra crutch. If the stairs are crowded, act as a buffer and run interference for the person. People using wheelchairs are trained in special techniques to transfer from one chair to the other. Depending on their upper body strength, they may be able to do much of the work themselves. Caring techniques for people who use non-motorized wheelchairs. The in-chair carry is the most desirable technique to use if possible. One person assists going down steps or stairs. Grasp the pushing grips if available. Stand one step above and behind the wheelchair. Tilt the wheelchair chill backward until a balance is achieved. Keep your center of gravity low. Descend frontward. Let the back wheels gradually lower to the next step. Two person assist. Going down stairs or steps. Position the first rescuer as described in the one person assist above. Position the second rescuer in front of the wheelchair and face the wheelchair. Stand one, two, or three steps down. Grasp the frame of the wheelchair. Push into the wheelchair. Descend the stairs backwards. Motorized wheelchair. Motorized wheelchairs may weigh more than 100 pounds unoccupied and may be longer than manual chairs. Lifting a motorized wheelchair and user up or down stairs requires two to four people. People who use motorized wheelchairs probably know their equipment much better than you do. Before lifting, ask about heavy chair parts that can be temporarily detached, how you should position yourselves, where you should grab hold, and what, if any, angle to tip the chair backward. Turn the wheelchair's power off before lifting it. Many people who use motorized wheelchairs have limited arm and hand motion. Ask if they have any special requirements for being transported up or down the stairs. This video training series is courtesy of the County of San Diego Office of Emergency Services. Every emergency call, every emergency run, every life save starts with you, the first responder. But what do you do when confronted with evacuees with needs who may pose a challenge to your typical training methods? The following video is one of a series of eight. It's designed to educate you on the various visual cues, do's, and don'ts proper behaviors, mannerisms, and sensitivities relating to those members of our San Diego community with cognitive disabilities. Our hope is that you learn as much as you can so that when lives are depending on quick thinking and fast maneuvering, you have the knowledge and training to make the best decision possible. Hi, Teresa. I'm Dan Green, I'm a captain for San Diego Fire Department. I'm here to ask you some questions about people with cognitive disabilities. Thanks, Dan. I'm Teresa Dwight, and I am a speech pathologist here in San Diego. And um, I'm also the president of the San Diego Brain Injury Foundation. What could have caused people to have cognitive disabilities? Cognitive disabilities come from a variety of sources. They come from right CVAs or right-sided strokes. They come from traumatic brain injuries. They come from um, dementia processes like Alzheimer's. Um, and so the range of the severity can go from something very mild to something very severe. Typically, persons with Alzheimer's have cognitive disabilities, but individuals with cognitive disabilities don't necessarily have Alzheimer's. What are some of the common myths or stereotypes that people might assume individuals with cognitive disabilities have? You know, that's an interesting question, that people assume that because they have cognitive disabilities that they also have dementia, and therefore their skills are not amenable to getting better, which is not true. We do cognitive rehabilitation therapy and people regain skills. The second thing that, that really riles them is that people assume that because they have cognitive disabilities that speaking louder 
it will help them process information faster, and it, it doesn't. Cognitive disabilities impact across ages. It's not just, you know, the 30-year-old that had that motorcycle accident, and it's not just the Alzheimer's 90-year-old. Fire department, anybody home? How should a first responder communicate to a, an individual like this with cognitive disabilities to let them know that we need to evacuate and in, in, in a manner that they can understand? Hello and welcome. You know, first responders are in, in a very difficult situation because when they come in, it's an urgent situation. Hi ma'am, my name's Kyle, I'm a firefighter. There's been a gas leak in your neighborhood and we have to have you evacuate your home, okay? Can you come with me? No, thank you. Hold on, ma'am. But when they first come in, what's important to the person is that they introduce themselves showing the badge so that the, the person with a cognitive disability recognizes concretely that they are a first responder and not just someone with a name, that they describe why they're there, that they use a voice that they would use with any other person, um, and that they let them know what's happening and what they're about to do before that action um, happens. There's been an emergency and we need to be able to have you come outside of your home, okay? Can I help I'm you not, grab? I'm, I'm not supposed to go any place. I, I understand that, ma'am, but there's been an emergency. We need to have you come out of your home for your own safety. Okay. So can you elaborate on some of the visual cues that a first responder might see when we're, we're dealing with a person with cognitive disabilities? What cognitive disabilities are problems with attention, how someone processes information, how they remember, and how they use that information to solve problems and to plan, and also to use those skills on the spot when they need it. You want some lemonade? The difficult thing is, unless there's a coexisting physical disability, it's very hard to tell that someone has a cognitive disability. A few of the red flags would be um, a delay in responding. Do you need a purse? Do you have any medications, anything like that at all that I can get for you? I'm we not need supposed to, get you to out leave of the house. my house. Or the inability to um, follow a train of thought. One example of something that a first responder can look for is a confused facial expression because they're having a hard time adding up what all of these little pieces of an alarm going off, their smoke, and coming to a decision about what all these means can be a very confusing process. Do you have any medications that you can show me where they're at or a purse? Um, you can't have my purse. How about some medications? The is second um, behavior is to look for examples of short-term memory issues. Um, this isn't information from long ago, like their date of birth. It's more like things that happened recently. Come this way. Um, this is my house. OK. Um, and that's my outside. And the lock on the door is there. OK, perfect. Looks like the door's already locked. Can we get your purse and maybe some medications of yours that you might have? No, but thank you. Well, we, we kind of need to get those so we can get you outside of the house, OK, ma'am? Last thing to look for are signs of escalation or agitation. As that situation begins to grow, their ability to handle it isn't as efficient. I was supposed to get you something. So what happens is they start becoming restless, and that restlessness evolves into greater behaviors um, of resistance and eventually to combativeness. I get you something, and it was mm -hmm. important because... Yes, ma'am. When someone with a cognitive disability starts to escalate, the behavior that we witness is agitation. And that agitation can range from something as simple as not being able to sit still to somebody that's combative. Okay. What are any do's and don'ts that we need to know? I think the most important thing is that the person recognizes the urgency of the situation and that you're there to help them. To communicate that, it's important to get down to their level and describe things in very simple terms. Absolutely. Is there anything else you need for us All to right, take? All right, bye-bye. No, you have to come with me, ma'am, okay? 
My job is to get you out of the house, okay? People assume that because they have cognitive disabilities, that speaking louder will help them process information faster, and it, it doesn't. And give instructions one by one instead of grouped into a series. Instead of saying, I need you to put your hand on my shoulder, step up so we can go out, each time they complete a step, introduce the next instruction. So if you were to give that direction, you could say, I need you to put your hand on my shoulder. So they do that. I see. Be then very specific. Be very specific yeah. and wait for them to respond before the next instruction is given. You're going to follow me, OK? You're going to call my friend. Yes, ma'am. And the don'ts would be to not assume that what they say is 100% valid. I'll get your door. You're very nice. Thank you. So are you, ma'am. One of the landmarks with a person with a cognitive disability is that they have distortions in their understanding. Do I need to do anything? No. Right. Um, the second thing is to not assume that once they are in an area considered safe, that they're going to stay in that area. Here, stay uh, I'll go help. Okay, I'll go help. No, that's OK. Another landmark of someone with a cognitive disability is that the brakes in that frontal lobe just doesn't work as effectively. So when they have an impulse, the ability to stop that impulse is not as effective as someone without a cognitive disability. Is there a big fire? No, there was just a gas leak in your neighborhood. And just as a precaution, we're getting everybody out of their homes, OK? Gosh, do you yeah. want me to sit? No, you don't have to I sit. I can sit. If, if you prefer. I can sit. I can sit. OK, if you prefer to sit down I on the can. ground, that's fine. I can sit. Thank you for everything you've talked about. You've really given us a lot of great information and really have informed us uh, on how to deal with people with cognitive disabilities. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This concludes the cognitive disabilities video for first responders. For more information, please contact the San Diego Brain Injury Foundation at 619 2946541. I'm Tony Meacham, San Diego County Fire Chief. I'm Shelley Zimmerman, Chief of Police of the San Diego Police Department. Thank, Thank you, you for, for watching. watching. Case D is used to describe people who identify as culturally deaf and are actively engaged in the deaf community. Deaf with a capital D indicates a cultural identity for people with hearing loss who share a common culture and a shared sign language. People who identify as deaf are often born deaf and sometimes also have other family members who are deaf. However, many people who have hearing parents or were not born deaf but lost their hearing later in life, have become part of the deaf community. Deaf people often prefer to use sign language, and it may be their first language. Deaf people have often attended schools and programs for the deaf where they have been able to immerse themselves in deaf culture. People who are deaf take great pride in their deaf identity. Deaf, lowercase d, refers simply to the medical condition of having hearing loss. People who identify as deaf with a lower case D do not have a strong connection to the deaf community and most likely do not use sign language, preferring to communicate orally. There are a variety of reasons a person identifies as deaf with a lower case D. For instance, he or she may have been born to hearing parents and grown up in the hearing world with little or no exposure to the deaf community. Deafened or late deafened usually refers to a person who becomes deaf as an adult and, therefore, faces different challenges than those of a person who became deaf at birth as a child. Hard of hearing. Hard of hearing, or HOH, is a widely accepted term to describe someone with mild to moderate hearing loss. A person who is hard of hearing often does not use sign language as a first or preferred language. This may be due to never having the opportunity to learn sign language or preferring not to. Someone with mild to moderate hearing loss may identify as deaf, 
and being involved in deaf culture and deaf community. Likewise, someone who has a very small amount or no hearing may like to identify as hard of hearing rather than deaf or deaf with a capital D. Ultimately, all people have their own preferred term for how they identify themselves. If you are unsure about how someone ident identifies himself or herself, just ask. Hearing impaired. Hearing impaired is another commonly used term to describe a person with hearing loss, but many people in the deaf and hard of hearing communities find the term offensive. This is because of the implication it holds of being impaired. However, there are people with hearing loss who are comfortable with this term and self-identity as hearing impaired. However, to be on the safe side, it is best to avoid using this term when referring to someone else. Hearing. Within the deaf culture, the term hearing is used to identify people who are members of the dominant American culture. One might think that ASL sign for hearing is related to the group's ability to hear. Example, pointing when carrying a person pointing to the ear. However, the sign for hearing is related to the ability to talk. The act of talking is clearly visible to deaf people, whereas listening or hearing is not. From the deaf culture perspective, it is the act of talking that clearly represents the two groups. Essential tips and etiquette when dealing with the deaf and hard of hearing. In deaf culture, person first language, such as person who is deaf or person who is hard of hearing, has long been rejected because being culturally deaf is seen as a source of positive identity and pride. Instead, deaf culture uses deaf first language, deaf person or hard of hearing person. A person may present a pre-written note card. He or she may also have some type of recording on device or phone. Be aware of a person reaching for something to present to you. People who have hearing loss may be difficult to identify. Some people who have hearing loss do not accept or identify themselves as deaf or hard of hearing. Hearing aids and or cochlear implants do not guarantee that the person can hear and understand speech. Some people who are deaf or hard of hearing read lips, while some do not. Lip reading cannot be relied on for communication. Only 30 to 35 percent of spoken language is visible on the lips. Some people who are deaf or hard of hearing use their voice, and some do not. Deaf does not mean mute. Some who are deaf or hard of hearing may have difficulty with written or spoken English. English may be their second language. Sign language is different from English and might be their first language. Not all people who are deaf or hard of hearing know sign language. There is a wide range of communication preferences and styles among people with hearing loss. Some may use hearing but rely on amplification and or lip reading. Others may use sign language. Most people who are hard of hearing do not use sign language, while others may speak gestures or choose to write to This video training series is courtesy of the County of San Diego Office of Emergency Services. Every emergency call, every emergency run, every life saved starts with you, the first responder. But what do you do when confronted with evacuees with needs who may pose a challenge to your typical training methods? The following video is one of a series of eight. It's designed to educate you on the various visual cues, do's and don'ts proper behaviors, mannerisms, and sensitivities relating to those members of our San Diego community who are deaf or hard of hearing. Our hope is that you learn as much as you can so that when lives are depending on quick thinking and fast maneuvering, you have the knowledge and training to make the best decision possible. My name is Joe Levine and I'm with Heartland Fire and Rescue. Yeah, hello. My name is Alan, I'm Ann and I'm with Deaf Community Services of San Diego. We're a service organization here in San Diego for the deaf and hard of hearing community. I'm glad to be part of this project. Alan, what is the difference between deaf and hard of hearing? Deaf and hard of hearing have several meanings, physical meanings and cultural meanings. Physically, deaf typically means a person who is profoundly unable to hear. Hard of hearing means that the person will have some degree of hearing <laughs> and it's dependent on the individual. Hard of hearing people typically use hearing aids or other assistive devices like that. 
Culturally, deafness means that you're a person who uses ASL to communicate. And you feel like, as a deaf person, that you're part of the deaf community. Hard of hearing people, perhaps to a lesser degree, they might use ASL, or they're perhaps more oriented towards speech and listening methods of communication with hearing aids and, and other devices. Alan, what are some myths associated with the deaf community? There are two that I can think of right now. Number one, not all deaf people are able to lip read effectively. Lip reading is kind of an ineffective way of communicating. Related to that, hearing people sometimes think if they yell at the deaf person that the deaf person will understand better, or if they speak into the ear of the deaf person that they'll be able to understand better, but that's not true. The second myth is that all deaf people use sign language. Some people use American Sign Language very effectively, some don't use it at all. Some are new signers, some are late deafened signers. So each individual is different, and the communication method in order to communicate with a deaf or hard of hearing person will vary for each individual. Hi, I'm Sergeant Lowe with San Diego Police Department. You know that construction down the road? It's, uh, they hit a gas line and the, the fire department's asking if we can evacuate. Is that gonna be okay? Do you, oh, you don't, do you speak English, Spanish? Alan, how can first responders immediately tell if someone's deaf or hard of hearing? And what are some visual clues that might let them know this? There are different clues that you can find. There are communication clues, and there are also visual clues. You'll notice that the deaf or hard of hearing person is more responsive to visual orientation or visual stimulus. Deaf, you're deaf. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Do you, um, do you have something to write with, pen, pen, paper? Oh, okay, cool. So there's, um, like I said, there's a gas leak. When you drive out of here, When you speak to them, you'll see a lack of response. You'll notice misunderstandings. They'll ask you often to repeat what you said or perhaps give you no response at all, especially if you're looking away or not looking directly at them. Another possibility is you'll notice something like a hearing aid or a cochlear implant or assistive device. Alan, what ways may a deaf person try to communicate with a first responder? There are many different methods that a deaf person might use. Primarily, it'll be a visual method, or perhaps a tactile method. Visually, they'll try to communicate through facial expressions and body language, perhaps even gesturing. They might use written form of communication, whether that's pen and paper or text messaging. Some deaf people feel comfortable speaking and might try and use their voice. Other deaf might not use their voice, and they would rather use visual tactile method. Tactilely, they might tap you on the shoulder to get your attention. Sometimes deaf people will even scream. If they're in serious risk of, of injury, they might try to stomp their feet on the ground or to pound on a table or bang on something to get the attention of a first responder. When that happens, be aware that it doesn't mean that the person is trying to be aggressive or, or angry or anything like that. It just really means that it's an emergency situation and they want to get attention the best way they can. And that's something that you can expect. It's important not to respond with anxiety or shock, but handle the situation calmly. Helen, how should a first responder communicate to someone who's deaf? I think the number one goal of a first responder should be clear in their communication. Sometimes people will try to communicate with deaf people through lip reading or by trying to speak at them. If it's a last resort and that's your only option, make sure that you're speaking clearly and that your face is unobstructed so that they understand what you're saying. Do not try to talk into their ear or scream at them. Alan, is writing back and forth an acceptable way to communicate with someone who's deaf? Uh, yes. When you're communicating through paper and pen, make sure that you're writing as clearly and as directly as possible, and that you ensure that what you're writing is understandable by people of all different cultures and reading levels. But you have to understand that writing back and forth could have the potential for misunderstandings. It might take more time. Sign language interpreters tend to be more effective, but pen and paper can be used if the deaf or hard of hearing person can freely and, and comfortably write back and forth. Hearing aids, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You can grab whatever you want. Uh, let me see, um, whatever you need. 
Okay, cool. Alan, are there any specific dangers that being deaf or hard of hearing pose to the, either themselves or first responders? If there's any danger involved, it would be to the deaf person or hard of hearing person themselves, because it can be easy to misunderstand their attempts to communicate or refusing to cooperate with a deaf or hard of hearing person. Alan, what about etiquette when communicating with someone who's deaf? The best way is to approach that deaf person and to ask them, how do you feel or what is the best method by which we can communicate? If their request is for a sign language interpreter, I request you call one as promptly as possible. And it's important to recognize that the deaf person is there. If you're using a sign language interpreter to communicate with the deaf person, don't look at the interpreter. Look at the deaf person themselves and speak directly to them. I think it's important that the first responder take steps to communicate directly with the deaf person, whether through eye contact or through gesture or different modes of communication. The feeling that you're there and that you're part of the process is important to the deaf person. Alan, thank you for all that information that you've given us and first responders. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Sure. Uh, here in San Diego, my organization, DCS, Deaf Community Service of San Diego, works in collaboration with OES, the Office of Emergency Services, to set up the Disaster Response Interpreting Initiative, where we train interpreters how to respond in emergency situations. There's more information that can be found through either OES or through DCS's website. Thank you for having me here. This concludes the deaf and hard of hearing video for first responders. For more information, please contact Deaf Community Services of San Diego at 619-398-2441. I'm Tony Meacham, San Diego County Fire Chief. I'm Shelly Zimmerman, Chief of Police of the San Diego Police Department. Thank, Thank you, you for, for watching. watching. Suggested communication techniques. Look at the person for whom the interpreter is interpreting. Do not look at the sign language interpreter. Do not exclude a person who is deaf or hard of hearing from a conversation. Take any card or note that is provided to you so that the person knows you have received the message. Then hand it back unless instructed otherwise. A person who is deaf might communicate using written messages or pre-recorded messages. These are used to convey essential information about their activities. Before speaking to a person who is deaf or has a loss of hearing, make sure you get the person's attention. Gently touch the person on the shoulder, extend your arm, or wave your hand. If you are aware that the person is deaf or hard of hearing, flick the lights when entering an area or room to get his or her attention. Follow the person's cues to find out the communication style preference. When in doubt, ask the person the preferred mode. If you have trouble understanding the speech of a person who is deaf or hard of hearing, let the person know. Face the person and offer unobstructive view of mouth. Be aware facial hair on a speaker may affect understanding. Maintain eye contact. Consider using pen and paper. Write slowly and let the person read as you write. Use facial expressions and body language to convey tone. Minimize audible and visual environment toll distractions. Do not whisper or yell into their ears. Do not shine flashlight in face or eyes. Use of pen lights for diagnostic information is acceptable. Consider the use of phone communication applications such as Make It Big, Show Me for Emergencies, Show Me for Emergencies Family Assistance Center, Microsoft Translator, or Translate Me, Live Translation. If he or she has assistive technology such as phone, hearing aid, listening devices, use those. Also use stock communication tools such as picture communication boards, or 100 signs for emergencies. Blind, a person who is unable to see because of injury, disease, or congenital condition. Blindness, blindness is defined as the state of being sightless. A blind person is unable to see. 
In a strict sense of the word, blindness denotes the inability of a person to distinguish darkness from bright light in either eye. The term blind and blindness have been modified in our society to include a wide range of visual impairment. Blindness is frequently used today to describe severe visual decline in one or both eyes with maintenance of some residual vis vision. Legal blindness. Legal blindness is not a medical diagnosis. It is a level of vision loss that has been legally defined to determine eligibility for benefits. In the United States, this refers to medically diagnosed central visual acuity of 2200 or less in the better eye with the best possible correction and or a visual field of 20 degrees or less. Often, people who are diagnosed with legal blindness still have some usable vision. Low vision. A person with low vision is one who has impairment of visual functioning even after treatment and or standard refractive correction and has a visual acuity of less than 618 to light perception or a visual field less than 10 degrees from the point of fixation, but who uses or is potentially able to use vision compensa compensatory visual strategies, low vision devices and environmental modifications for the planning and or execution of a task for which vision is essential. Visual disorders. Visual disorders are abnormalities in the eye, the optic nerve, the optic tracts, or the brain that may cause a loss of visual acuity or visual field. A loss of visual acuity limits your ability to distinguish detail, read, or do fine work. A loss of visual field limits your ability to perceive visual stimuli in the peripheral extent of vision. Visual impairment, often defined as a best corrected visual acuity of worse than either 2040 or 2060, a term that encompasses both those who are blind and those with low vision. Additional factors influencing visual impairment might be contrast sensitivity, light sensitivity, glare sensitivity, and light dark adaptation. Vision loss refers to people who have trouble seeing even when wearing glasses or contact lenses, as well as people who are blind or unable to see at all. Tips and etiquette for dealing with people with sensory impairments of being blind, low vision, or visual impairment. Always communicate any written information orally. Most people who are blind or have low vision are extremely self-sufficient. Always communicate any changes or dangers in the environment. Service animals should be transported with the person. After having introduced yourself and others initially, re-identify yourself each time you approach a person who is blind or low vision. If providing guiding assistance, allow the person to take you by the arm. If the person has a guide dog, walk on the side opposite the dog. Do not touch the person's cane or guide dog. The dog is working and needs to concentrate. The cane is part of the person's personal space. If the person puts the cane down, do not move it. Let him or her know if it's in the way. When guiding, be descriptive about obstructions. Use directions such as down, right or left. Be sure to mention stairs, doorways, narrow passages, ramps, etc. before you come to them, such as go to your left. There is a curb here. Step up. We are going to go down a flight of stairs. We are going to go through a doorway, a narrow passage, or a ramp. Tell the person if you are having, tell the person if you are stepping away or leaving. If you leave a person you have been guiding who is blind, leave the person by a wall or something other landmark. The center of a room can seem like no man's land. Make the person aware of any change conditions, temporary barriers, remodeling. If you move any furniture to get your ambulance gurney to the patient, make sure you return the furniture to its original location. People who have low vision or blindness often rely on familiarity of their environment to navigate. Any change in the environment may present tripping or fall hazards for them. Always speak directly to the person, not to his or her escort. Do not shout, the person is blind, not deaf. It is okay to use words such as see, look, or blind, 
it is okay to say see you later or see you tomorrow. This video training series is courtesy of the County of San Diego Office of Emergency Services. Every emergency call, every emergency run, every life saved starts with you, the first responder. But what do you do when confronted with evacuees with needs who may pose a challenge to your typical training methods? The following video is one of a series of eight. It's designed to educate you on the various visual cues, do's and don'ts proper behaviors, mannerisms, and sensitivities of the blind and low vision population of San Diego County. Our hope is that you learn as much as you can so that when lives are depending on quick thinking and fast maneuvering, you have the knowledge and training to make the best decision possible. Hi, I'm Joe Levine with Heartland Fire Rescue. I'm Casey Markowski. I'm an orientation and mobility specialist at the San Diego Center for the Blind. Casey, what are some common myths with people who are blind or visually impaired? Well, we want to first define the word blind. Blind can encompass anyone from someone with low vision to someone who's completely blind with no vision at all. That being said, you want to treat every person who has a visual impairment as if they're totally blind. Common myths people hear about is that they wear sunglasses. And actually, that's not true. Only a few people prefer to wear sunglasses. Another common myth is that when you are visually impaired, your hearing is improved. And that's actually a myth. Your hearing is not more improved. When you lose your vision, you do rely more on auditory clues around you to help orient yourself. But it doesn't give you better hearing. Casey, what sort of protocol should someone follow when encountering someone who's blind? Well, you would want to treat a person who is visually impaired just like you would treat anyone else. Just because they have a vision loss doesn't mean they are helpless. So you should always respect their personal space. Hi, we've got an emergency in the building. We need to evacuate. I can't stay here. I mean, is that bad? So you always want to state your name and your title and make sure you're facing them when you're talking to them. You also want to state the nature of the emergency I, I, I and ask how you can help them and ask permission before touching them. If you need to touch them, let them know where you're going to touch them and if you need to change positions. This could really startle them if you just grab them and begin to guide them. Casey, is there any specific equipment that we should bring with us during evacuation? Yes, there are. You want to make sure they have any type of mobility device that they are currently using with them. For example, the long cane is a type of mobility device that helps them get around safely. You also want to bring with them a walker or a support cane if they have it. The guide dog is also a type of mobility device. So if the guide dog's present, you want to keep the guide dog with the person as much as possible. By not having a mobility device present, you're essentially trapping them in one location. Fire department, anyone home? We have an emergency in the building, we have to evacuate. Hi, we have an emergency in the building, we need to evacuate. Okay, um, this is my guide dog, and, and we're gonna need some help. Are there any such protocols when dealing with a guide dog? Yes, there are. In an emergency, if you need to take the dog for any reason, make sure you ask permission of the handler. Is it okay if I take the dog? Um, yes, probably that's better. When you take the guide dog, be sure to hold the leash and not the harness so that the dog is relaxed and knows to follow you and that they are not working. Casey, will you speak a little more on walking with them or helping to guide? Well, when guiding a person who is visually impaired, you need to be very specific about the environment. There we go. We're going to go you. straight ahead about 30 feet. Okay. And we're going to turn left. Okay. For example, you don't want to use terms like, oh, it's up ahead or it's over there. They can't see where over there is. Here's our left turn. Okay, thank you. We're going to go through the elevator lobby. Okay. About another 10 feet, we're gonna go to the right. Okay. For example, if you're looking for a door, you wanna let them know it's 10 feet ahead. When guiding a person, you also wanna point out what obstacles are coming up, such as a chair or a table. You wanna let them know, is the chair facing them? Is it facing away from them? Does the chair have arms? And is there a table in front of the chair? 
Always use human guide techniques when guiding a person who is visually impaired. Okay. Casey, what is the human guide technique and what are the steps? So the human guide technique is a proper way to guide someone who has a visual impairment so that you keep your space and they keep theirs. The steps to human guide technique are simple. You just offer your arm and they'll hold right above your elbow. You want my arm? Yes, please. Okay, here we go. It's okay. This gives them good stability when walking and following you. Also, you wanna make sure you're not grabbing their hand to guide them. By grabbing their hand and trying to guide them, they become very disoriented. By offering your arm, this gives them much more stability. Also, they will remain one step behind you so as not to run into your feet. When encountering a narrow area, you wanna bring your arm behind your back so that the person knows to follow behind you. When you're encountering doors, you wanna let them know, is the door coming towards you or away from you? Is the door on the right or on the left? This can be important information so that they don't run into the door. Also, when approaching stairs, to let them know if there's a handrail next to them that they can grab onto. Let them know whether you're going up or down when you're at the top of the stairs and when you've reached the bottom. Descriptive language is very important to help them orient themselves to their environment, especially in a scary situation. It's okay, it's gonna be okay. When there's a guide dog present, you wanna make sure you are holding the opposite side of the guide dog when you're doing human guide. Always try to keep the dog with the person who has a visual impairment so that they are not separated. In some emergency situations, you may be required to relocate a person. In that case, make sure the blind person is able to contact someone. Casey, I wanna thank you for all this useful information. It's gonna be very greatly used for all first responders. Well, I really appreciate you guys doing this and we appreciate all you do. And I hope this helps you guys understand people with visual impairments a little better and how you can help them. This concludes the blind and low vision training video for first responders. For more information, please contact the San Diego Center for the Blind at 619-583-1542. I'm Tony Meacham, San Diego County Fire Chief. I'm Shelly Zimmerman, Chief of Police of the San Diego Police Department. Thank, Thank you, you for, for watching. watching. Suggested communication techniques. Take any card or note that is provided to you so that the person knows you have received the message, then hand it back unless instructed otherwise. A person who is blind might communicate using written messages or pre-recorded messages. These are used to convey essential information about their activities. Establish eye contact if possible and appropriate. Ask people who are blind or have low vision, where do you want me to stand? Some people may need to bring you into their line of focus. He or she may want to take your hand or shoulder and move you where it's best to see you. Do not move after establishing visual range. Once he or she has you in the field of vision, stay in the same position until you have finished the communication exchange. Providing assistance and removing barriers. EMS agencies should offer print materials in alternate formats, large print, braille, electronic for screen reader users. In the deaf-blind community, using your fingers to draw an X on the person's back or near his or her shoulder is an indication that there is an emergency and that he or she should trust and follow you. Note, this is used in the culturally deaf-blind community. People who may have vision and hearing loss but are not part of the deaf-blind community will not understand this cue. For the safety of the person, share this information only with the other emergency responders. Deaf blindness is described as a unique and isolating sensory disability resulting from a combination of both a hearing and vision loss or impairment that significantly affects communication, socialization, mobility, and daily living. The federal definition of deaf blindness means concomitant hearing and visual impairments, the combination of which causes severe communication and other developmental and educational needs. Congenital deafblindness is a term used 
if a person is born with a sight and hearing impairment or when the combined hearing and vision impairment occurs before spoken, signed, or other visual forms of language and communication have developed. This may be due to infections during pregnancy, premature birth, birth trauma, and rare genetic conditions. Acquired deaf blindness is a term used if a person experiences sight and hearing loss later in life. This can be people who are born deaf or hard of hearing and later experience deteriorating sight. Usher syndrome, for example, causes deafness or hearing impairment at birth and vision impairment later in life. People who are born vision impaired or blind can go on to experience hearing loss at a later stage. Some people with acquired deaf blindness are born with vision and hearing that deteriorates later in their life through accident, injury, or disease. For a significant number of people, the aging process is a cause of dual sensory loss or deaf blindness. People who are deaf blind may not be immediately identifiable due to the etiology, degree, timing of onset, and level of stability of the vision and hearing loss, it is impossible to determine a specific person's visual acuity and or auditory acuity. He or she may or may not use canes, service animals, hearing aids, and or a cochlear implant. Deaf blind does not mean totally deaf and blind. Most people may have some but very limited or poor vision. Some may be hard of hearing or profoundly deaf. Some deaf people have enough vision to be able to see writing. If someone reaches for your hand, tactile sign, or your face or lips, tactile lip reading, it may be an attempt to communicate. Tactile lip reading is a method of communicating with the blind and deaf whereby their hands are placed on the lips of the speaker. The person with dual sensory loss feels out the shape of the words as you say them. This is similar to lip reading not all people who are deaf blind can use tactile lip reading, and not everyone will be comfortable with another person placing a hand on their mouth. If a person attempts to lead you to or reaches for something, it may be an attempt to demonstrate an object as a means of communication. Exploring objects should be done in a non-directive way, allowing the person who is deaf blind to have control. People who are deaf blind will often need touch in order for them to be sure their partner shares their focus of attention. Look for a communication partner, not the same as an interpreter. In some cases, people with dual sensory loss are accompanied by a partner trained to facilitate communication for the deaf blind, and they will have developed rapport with each other. A variety of ways exist to speak to a deaf-blind person. The method of choice depends on the level of impairment of each sense. A deaf-blind person may not be profoundly deaf or completely blind. Many deaf-blind people can use sign language if they have some vision. The most common way for a profoundly deaf-blind person to communicate is using tactile sign language or the deaf-blind manual alphabet. Both methods rely on hand contact to communicate. If you are not certain you can be accurate with tactile sign language, do not use this method. Some people know the tactile fingerspelling signs. If you choose to use fingerspelling, place your hand under theirs and form the letters individually in the palm of their hand. The person will likely guide your hand into the correct position. For people who do not know sign language or fingerspelling, it is possible to use the print on palm or POP method by using your index finger to trace the letters on the blind and deaf person's palm. The person may also choose this method to respond to you. Do not use acronyms. Use short phrases or single words. To get a deaf-blind person's attention, gently touch on their shoulder, arm, or hand. Give the deaf-blind person time to find where you are 
letting the person put their hand on yours may help. Waving hands may not help because he or she may not be able to see you. People may or may not respond to voice depending on the level of hearing loss. Identify yourself every time. A deaf blind person's vision may be bad enough that he or she can't see who you are easily, nor read your name tag. Their hearing loss may prevent them from recognizing you by voice or spoken name. Print your name and role, for example, Judy, EMT, in thick marker on a card to show him or her. Always directly inform the deafblind person of your arrival and leaving. Do not assume that he or she knows you are there or not. If a deafblind person has some sight, positioning is key. Do not stand in front of a light source or window, as he or she will not be able to see your face due to backlighting. Position yourself where light falls on you and not in their eyes. Also, if the person is sitting or lying in a bed, sit at the same level so they do not have to look up to see you while they are communicating. Inform the deaf blind person before you begin to do anything with them or to them. For example, do not move them or grab their arm without first explaining what you are about to do and why. Check frequently for understanding. If an emergency happens and you must exit with a deafblind person quickly, draw an X on the deafblind person's back with your finger and lead him or her out by the arm. X on the back is a universal deafblind sign for emergency. If back is not available, draw an X in their palm. Note, this is used in the culturally deafblind community. People who may have vision and hearing loss, but are not a part of the deafblind community, will not understand this cue. People with cognitive mental health issues may have sensitivities or varied abilities or inabilities to cope with common emergency scene conditions, sirens, flashing lights, lots of noise, confusion, numbers of people rushing around, etc. People who have cognitive mental health issues are not always easy to identify, and in many cases do not identify themselves as such. You may not be able to tell if people have cognitive mental health issues until you are interacting and communicating with them. Some cognitive mental health conditions can be misinterpreted. Examples of possible conditions that may be easily misinterpreted will be listed in specific sections that follow. For example, someone might mistake cerebral palsy for drunkenness. Military service members, veterans, and other people may have cognitive mental health conditions due to traumatic brain injuries or post-traumatic stress disorder. General awareness people with cognitive mental health issues may have short attention spans and the need to take more time to comprehend. Difficulty reasoning and solving problems. Difficulty remembering things, planning or organizing. Pressured, halted or broken speech patterns. Augmentative and alternative communication devices. Difficulty with coordination and motor functions. Irrelevant dialogue. Involuntary, non-aggressive or non-directed cursing. Unusual behavior or inappropriate responses, verbal or non-verbal. Example, a building is on fire and the person is talking about the weather. Inappropriate emotions or oversensitivity. People with cognitive mental health issues may not have the ability to read. The ability to speak and make their needs known. People with cognitive mental health issues may show signs of stress and or confusion in their nonverbal body language, such as confused facial expressions, physical withdrawal from communication, rubbing hands together, rocking, anxiety, overly friendly, indifference, facial flat affect, absence of facial expressions, agitation, personality changes, paranoia or hallucinations, avoidance of eye contact or touch, sudden, repetitive movements or sounds that can be difficult to control, involuntary tics, obsessive repetition of a particular action, word or phrase, bewilderment indicated by the person not able to understand anything that is happening.
general etiquette and tips for dealing with people with mental health, cognitive, intellectual, or developmental impairments include Point to any objects as you speak about them. Use pictures or objects to illustrate your words. Demonstrate what you mean. Showing someone can be more effective than telling. Allow the person to complete his or her sentence or reply. Do not assume the person is unintelligent. Finishing his or her sentence or reply will only frustrate the person and serve to highlight the condition. Avoid interrupting people who might be disoriented or rambling. Be empathetic toward the person. Show that you have heard him or her and care about what he or she has told you. Be reassuring, rephrase or restate if the person does not understand. Sometimes only one word is causing confusion. If the person is delusional, just let him or her know you are there to help. Remove a person with cognitive mental health conditions from confusion and reduce distractions. Example, lower volume of the radio, use flashing lights on the vehicle only when necessary. If available, consider noise cancelling devices, such as headphones, for the person with a great sensitivities or confusion. Ask the person if he or she is willing to put them on. Explain what you are doing. Do not shine a flashlight in the person's face or eyes. The use of pen lights for diagnostic information is acceptable.